Hello, and welcome to Beacon Point's Manager Insights webinar series. My name is Jason Overholzer, and I cover equity manager research here at Beacon Point. Today, we are hosting a market and strategy update featuring Chris Wallace of Vaughn Nelson Investment Management. Chris is Chief Investment Officer and Senior Portfolio Manager of the Small Cap Value Strategy. This year has been a challenging environment for active small cap managers as the index has been driven by a rally, a rally in lower quality stocks. Therefore, we thought it would be timely to have, a, have Vaughn Nelson review their thoughts on the current market and discuss some of the themes they are seeing today. Chris, thank you for joining us. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, and yeah, what I'll talk about initially is just kind of the state of the market and a little bit of history as to what led us to kind of year-to-date performance and then really what we see happening as we move forward. Um, and I'll kind of bring back a little history and talk about the credit crisis, but not from a scary standpoint, but from a standpoint of we're starting to get kind of dominant macro factors that are having a huge influence on individual security movements. And whereas in the crisis in end of 07 into early 09, it was really driven by credit losses and lack of liquidity. This is very different because it's really driven by uh, movements in the dollar, and those movements in the dollar are being dictated by not only our fiscal policy, but also kind of some uh, geopolitical uh, issues that the world's dealing with. And so the way I would kind of think about how going from the crisis to where we are now, uh, what's really led to some of the vulnerabilities and some of the sharp movements is really the quantitative easing as volatility was suppressed and the major central banks have been printing money, that money to the extent it doesn't get absorbed into real economic activity goes into capital markets and can distort liquidity and can distort asset values. And essentially in a world of relatively low returns where factors are, are starting to dominate fundamentals, we've built up a series of what I would call carry trades um, and those carry trades are funded by hard currencies or currencies of the developed market, primarily being uh, the yen and the euro and the dollar. And the dollar is by far uh, the largest uh, of those currencies. And so you have a situation where as it is a borrowed currency to buy other risk assets, as dollar liquidity tightens up, it creates significant shifts in uh, liquidity across markets and, and therefore price movements. Um, so just on kind of page one, state of the markets after a decade and some 21 trillion of quantitative easings, as we've said, capital markets have become a, a series of carries trades funded by the U.S. dollar. Um, and what that really means is with the, the significant growth of uh, the emerging markets, as the dollar is the reserve currency, if they've grown and needed to import goods, they would use the U.S. dollar, and access to that dollar came through various forms. Uh, the large portion of that was from U.S. consumers. As we imported goods from the rest of the world, we exported our dollars, and those countries would use those dollars to import the goods they need, as well as to fund their businesses, their working capital. They could borrow cheaper because it was dollar denominated, but it also uh, created a mismatch. And then what slowly started to happen, and it really began in 2014 and kind of accelerated um, in the last couple of years was, we are not producing enough dollars to go out to the rest of the world to be used as the reserve currency. And there's a handful of reasons for that. One is the developing world has just gotten so large relative to the global economy the U.S. isn't sufficiently large enough to consume enough to export enough dollars. And then secondarily, the primary way we sent dollars overseas was by the importation of oil. And since we've become a very large producer of oil, uh, we're not exporting as many dollars. And that's creating this dollar tightness uh, and is really what's been pressuring commodities and emerging markets for the last year or so. Uh, what's happened as a result of that? We've seen China, which really needs to get off the U.S. dollar standard. Uh, we're going to see that right now they're actually starting to run uh, current account deficits for the first time. 
and since they rely on the dollar, they need access to those dollars, and so they somewhat give up a portion of their sovereignty. And their solution to that has been, over the last two to two and a half years, to set up their currency, the yuan, so that it's fully convertible into gold at a floating rate, and then use that with allies to start importing goods. And the first time we saw this was Russia uh, selling oil to China, accepting the yuan because it was freely convertible into gold. And subsequently, we've seen China pressure other uh, exporters to begin to accept the yuan. So we do think that's going to be an ongoing trend. Uh, and on top of that, since we've weaponized the dollar, uh, foreign central banks, quite frankly, uh, don't want to continue using the dollar. They want to find alternative payment systems. We're even seeing uh, Germany uh, start to make rumblings this week that there needs to be alternative uh, as well. So the world's setting up to use less dollars. Foreign central banks have not been buying and expanding their holding of U.S. treasuries, and that's going to come into play over the next year or so because Currently, uh, U.S. deficits are at wartime highs, yet the economy is booming. Um, so all of that, all of those factors is what's feeding into this trade war narrative. And the trade war did have a significant impact on the first half of this year, and it had a significant impact uh, on the small cap in particular. Uh, one, why a trade war? Uh, quite simply, if they don't buy our treasuries, we can't buy their goods. Um, and the, the federal government, with foreigners no longer increasing their U.S. Treasury holdings, has turned to domestic sources. The first source they went to was they went to the banking system, told the SIPI banks that they really need to hold more treasuries. And so that sufficed for a while. They did the same thing to the U.S. money markets, and that sufficed for a while. Uh, but now with deficits expanding, not just because of the tax cuts, but they're also expanding because entitlements are really starting to accelerate, somebody needs to service that debt and somebody needs to buy that. And this creates a twofold issue. It really does start to build up some of these geopolitical tensions because we can't absorb our deficit internally, but in order to do that, we need to consume less, which therefore reduces global economic growth. Uh, but it also means if the rest of the world isn't going to buy our treasuries, the dollar is going to start losing market share within the global economy as far as its status as reserve currency. And the U.S. loses, in fact, a lot of kind of geopolitical power. Um, and we're seeing real fractures along those lines kind of supporting this. And so, you know, as the crisis was dictated, by credit availability and liquidity. This is driven by government balance sheets becoming bloated because they've absorbed the losses from the crisis but haven't delevered. And this is true of all major uh, countries and all major central banks. And so we're starting to see those pressures on those federal balance sheets show up uh, within the currency markets. Now, typically, you would see concerns with U.S. deficits and lack of foreign buying of U.S. treasuries would show up in the form of higher uh, sovereign interest rates and a weaker dollar. That's not happening for a couple of reasons. One, the fiscal stimulus with the tighter monetary policy relative to the rest of the world does put upward pressure on the dollar. Two, because we're accelerating deficits, uh, we're, and we're increasing treasury issuance, that's actually sucking dollars in from the rest of the world. Um, and that effectively is creating a short squeeze in the dollar. And you got to keep in mind that, you know, 80 to 90 percent of emerging market corporate debt is financed in other than the local currency. And so that begins to, to draw up their uh, liquidity in those markets. And it's why we've seen such weakness in equity markets outside of the U.S. and such weakness in commodity markets, kind of ex-oil year to date. Um, you know, and again, we're moving into a, a, a portion of this next stage where China is going to be issuing its own currency. Uh, they need to, and so we've got two of the largest uh, global powers on the planet in a stalemate over trade wars. Neither one willing to blink because it's somewhat of an existential threat for both of them. 
And so this is adjustment that's been well telegraphed, kind of the, you know, the, the G5, G7 uh, Treasury secretaries have been talking about the need to move solely off the dollar. Uh, the IMF has been talking about this for a number of years, but it's a question of how quick an adjustment do we want to make? Are we going to do it gradually over 10 years? Are we going to do it abruptly over 10 months? And that will drive some of this shorter-term volatility in the dollar, but doesn't necessarily have a significant impact on the underlying value of individual companies, but it can certainly have a short-term impact on where prices move higher or lower across equity markets, be it sectors or even regions of the world. And so I do think we're getting to a point, and this is going to get a lot more press over, the, I think, the next 12 months, is deficits are going to start to matter again. Uh, interest is now uh, the third largest budget item. It's actually ahead of uh, the defense budget. And although deficits are at wartime levels, you know, the economy really is booming. I can't stress enough that the economy's fine. Uh, you know, we're not going to sustain the level of growth we have now. Uh, growth is somewhat peaking out, but the economy isn't broken. It's just really where liquidity is and where valuations are. That's, that's pretty much where the distortions are, truly really in the capital markets. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about kind of the two factors uh, that are driving the dollar strength uh, and the movements in non-dollar assets on page three. Uh, and another one, in addition to just the deficit spending, is the quantitative tightening by the Fed. And just given the nature of where those securities sit on the Fed's balance sheet, they've effectively been nationalized and pulled out of the private sector. When they shrink their balance sheet, they are shrinking excess reserves in the banking system. Uh, and it is having an impact not only on dollar availability, but credit costs. And we're starting to see that. Uh, the markets and the economy, they're healthy. They are in the later cycle. It doesn't mean we need to have a big slowdown or, you know, a nasty recession or anything like that. Uh, but it does mean we're starting to see weakness in the housing market now. Prices were moving a little too aggressively over the last 12 months relative to the increase we've seen in mortgage rates. So housing activity is going to level off for a while. Uh, we're going to see a leveling off in auto activity or a modest decline there. Uh, but employment is still healthy and will remain so. We don't have a lot of excess levels of employment through the economy. Uh, we're going to see healthy wage gains. I, I don't necessarily think we're going to see accelerating wage gains. But for the first time in several years, we're finally getting to what a normal business cycle looks like, which means as we get to the later stages, the Fed's trying to normalize policy. We're starting to see costs impact margins and companies not be able to keep up with price. However, what's different now versus prior cycles, this is probably the first time in the last 40 years where the account, where the, the Fed is actually trying to create inflation. So they're going to be very cautious. I really think they're going to do one more interest rate hike in September, and then they're going to be done. And if data deteriorates materially between now and September, we won't even get the September hike. Um, so I do think we're in a position where a lot of this dollar tightness and dollar pressure is going to roll over. Um, as far as the U.S. equity markets, uh, you know, we did have kind of the global synchronized growth in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, you know, what I'll say about that is it's nice when it happens, but never expect it because it's very rare that it happens. It happens less than 15 percent of the time in an econ global economy's history. Um, and we could see through the leading indicators that it was temporary and it was just, you know, the stars kind of aligned and all the major economies were accelerating. Uh, but we could see it was going to taper off in the rest of the world. We could see it was going to taper off on the industrial side, really driven by a leveling off in energy activity. Um, and that slowdown and the correction we saw in the first quarter of this year was the market's recognition that the global synchronized growth has peaked and that we were going to start to disengage, and that we were going to have a slowdown in Europe. We were going to have a slowdown in the commodity-driven countries, be it South America, uh, even Mexico, and certainly the, the slowdown that we've seen in China. And China's slowdown has really been driven by the desire to clean up their shadow banking system, uh, and they may have to back away with that given the trade war and some of the issues they're dealing with. Um, so as a result, you know, we went from this – 
a uh, heavy liquidity environment from QE. We started to see the Fed shrink its balance sheet. We started to see global growth uh, start to disengage. We started to see dollar uh, costs begin to increase. And then when the trade war rhetoric really started in earnest, it created a, a significant structural shift. And what it meant was people were unfortunately long the dollar because the dollar had been weak, I mean short the dollar because the dollar had been weak for the prior few quarters. Um, they were counting on kind of a sustained uh, synchronous growth globally, further tightening up in commodities and industrial activity. And the world was just on average, uh, you know, looking at taking advantage of what they believe to be better valuations in the rest of the world. But when the trade war started in earnest, it created a significant flow into U.S. dollars. And given the number of strategies out there that are factor-based or pair-traded, the risk tolerance for that level of dislocation is, is fairly low. And so we saw a lot of crowding in of money into dollar trade. And with the way we see it expressed uh, uh, over the last couple of years, because we saw this also when the discussion was around the corporate tax reform, people buy U.S. small cap assets. Uh, they view it as a pure play on the dollar. They view it, view it as somewhat insulated uh, from the slowdowns in international markets or less exposure to commodities. And just like we saw uh, in previous series, there was a mad rush into a lot of the indices and in small cap. Now, what I'll say about that is just like when people crowded into it, uh, for corporate tax reasons, it's it you know there's truth in price, and so prices went up. It's wrong in fundamentals. You know, U.S. small caps selectively benefit tremendously from the cut in corporate taxes, but 30% of the universe doesn't make any money, and another 15 to 20% are passed through entities uh, and regulated entities where they don't keep those tax cuts anyway. So the net impact isn't that different from large caps. Uh, conversely, as you look at trade wars, it is infinitely more difficult uh, for the U.S. small cap universe to cope with the trade war than it is for large caps. And that's because as you look at trade barriers and you look at tariffs, um, the dollar impact, whether you're large or small company, is the same. But small companies operate from a level of profitability that's 70 to 80 percent of what a large cap company does. So the percentage in hit to margins is much greater. Uh, and so that money flowing in there was a little misguided, but it was happening at a time when, you know, there was heavy short interest. And so, you know, we could really see what was driving returns was the loss makers, uh, companies with heavy short interest, and the most expensive companies in the market. And so that short covering rally that began in earnest uh, really continued almost through the end of the quarter, and it created a wide disparity in returns. So just as an example, on page four, you know, the market was up, was really led by companies that were losing money. So as you can imagine, being nine to ten years into a market expansion at almost all-time lows of capital costs, and you still can't make money, but those companies were up for over 14%. If you look at kind of levels of profitability, there was a 360 basis point spread between your kind of top three and bottom three deciles as, as measured on an ROA in favor of the least profitable companies. If you looked at the most shorted stocks, you know, they significantly outperformed the least shorted stocks. And then if you really rank them purely based on PE, you know, the top three deciles of the most expensive stocks vastly outperformed uh, you know, the least expensive stocks. So again, it was a big factor-based move. And we've seen a lot of it start to reverse already quarter to date because the short-term flows can certainly have an impact um, uh, over a small period of time, but ultimately fundamentals went out. Uh, the other thing that we noticed that was unusual is, you know, we do a lot of factor analysis here just to make sure, you know, what we own is, is what what factor exposures we, we think we want exposure to. And we have three different capitalization strategies. And you know, our, our, our head of risk went in and looked at price response relative to earnings results in the second quarter. And 
the mid cap and the large cap universes look very normal. What we saw in the small cap universe was very different, meaning it really didn't matter uh, how how much you beat or how much you missed. Kind of everything was up uh, versus typical environments where if you have a big miss in earnings and lower guidance, you would see a fall off. So we just further confirmation that there was just a lot of blind money coming in it was time dependent, not price and fundamental dependent. Um, so where are we today uh, on page five? Like I said, you know, economic growth is healthy. And it's not what we all grew accustomed to in, in the 80s or 90s, but, um, or the 2000s, but it, you know, it's healthy. It's, it reflects kind of our demographics. The consumer balance sheet is in phenomenal shape. Uh, corporate balance sheets are in okay shape. They're fully levered and will need to delever a little bit, but they're not scary leveraged. Uh, government balance sheets are an unmitigated disaster, and we're going to start to see that show up in more currency volatility and probably more crowding out of private sector borrowing over the next couple of years. Uh, we are seeing the classic signs of late cycle. You can see it in the sector analysis. You're seeing home builders sell off. Uh, you're seeing uh, the dollar tightness, the liquidity is starting to slow things down in the rest of the world. Uh, and we do think the Federal Reserve is going to have to stop or slow their rate increases as well as their quantitative tightening, or we're really going to risk further uh, breakdown in the market. Um, I know there's a lot of speculation that the Fed will have a fairly at large out of the money put for the market. Um, I think it's going to be a little closer to at the money than what people realize, and that's because. 25% of federal tax receipts still come from capital gains. So even a flattening market is a problem. As we look forward, uh, you know, I would think about, as I described earlier, uh, you know, we have these series of carry trades out there. Um, I would think of them as concentric circles with the strongest uh, carry trade in the center and the weakest ones on the outside. And so what I've listed here are kind of what, we believe some of these carry trades will represent um, and kind of rank them weakest to strongest. And so as we saw liquidity starting to tighten up, um, you know, we were given presentations late last fall where we said, look, the short vol trade is going to blow up. Uh, just the way it's structured, the way it's getting fund funded, it, it's not going to be sustainable. And lo and behold, you know, that was the first one to go with short volatility. The Turkish lira. Um, if it has nothing to do with a pastor in a prison, this has everything to do with a country that uh, borrowed a lot of money in foreign currencies and used that money in non-economic forms and is now functionally bankrupt. Um, I do think the Turkish lira, uh, the crisis they're experiencing, could spread to Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and the reason is there is, you know, a lot of money owed to foreign banks, and that money's levered up eight to ten times. So that's something to watch as well. Um, you know, the other, and, and we've seen the Turkish lira crack and the Turkish economy crack, and we haven't heard the end of that. Uh, luxury residential real estate in the global cities, that was another area where cheap dollars that were spreading around the world and generating economic activity were recycled back into hard assets. And we've seen some of those uh, luxury real estate prices begin to decline. Uh, then beyond that, you're going to get into the weaker areas of uh, the European Union, uh, both sovereign and corporate debt, and some of the prime examples would be Spain and Portugal. Uh, we probably wouldn't throw Italy in that category. Then to the extent there were pressures there, if they were going to spread, they're going to start to spread to some of the weaker uh, emerging markets and weaker really just from a financial position, not necessarily long-term structural growth, and that would be in India, Mexico, and China, or Brazil. And then finally, you'd start knocking on the door of the U.S. Uh, when you start to see pressure on the Australian and Canadian currencies and really their local housing markets, not in the main cities where we have a lot of foreign capital flow flowing and buying high-rises, but in your traditional uh, local residents. Uh, and then ultimately, if the Fed wants to continue to burn down the house with tight dollar policy, we're going to see uh, it really begin to impact the U.S. dollar and the S&P 500. 
So you can just see there's a there's a lot of pressure that you'd have to get through to have a significant impact on the market. It doesn't mean that we can in fact see more multiple compression. We certainly can. Uh, it does mean that you know there's probably not an easy resolution to the trade dispute with China. Um, and don't be surprised if some of these tariffs that have gone up stay up. Uh, for one reason is they work just like a VAT tax and it's just another way to fund deficits so that money gets paid in. Um, and then I just threw on a, a few charts on page six uh, just to visually highlight some of the elements that we saw in the second quarter. And, and you can see on the bar chart where you know it, was, it really didn't matter uh, what sector you looked at or what market cap range. It really was the most heavily shorted stocks that were driving returns. And then I threw out just one example, which is the scene of retail, which, you know, it, it's an apparel retailer with multiple uh, different brands, uh, has a reasonably levered balance sheet. They definitely have some debt. Uh, they're just now starting their online initiatives, so they're three years behind. They have several thousand stores they need to close. They lost well over $4 a share last year. Uh, they're going to lose money again this year and have a stressed balance sheet. And you can certainly see in the upper right-hand chart that the stock more than doubled during the quarter, and that's because it had 41 million shares short, uh, and about you know uh, 15 to 20% of that short was covered. Uh, subsequent to the quarter, that short has actually increased again. And then down below, you can see the longer term chart. Uh, and, you know, what I would say is it is certainly possible um, that maybe Asina and the world has changed and uh, they're going to come rushing back into uh, some of their brands. But I just suspect that that price movement had a lot more to do with the short position being covered in a relatively illiquid name and not as much to do with the structural turnaround. Um, so, again, we're, you know, we're, we're uh, reasonably optimistic on economic growth. Um, we're seeing really significant dislocations in where value is in the market and really use the, quite frankly, the volatility in the quarter because it sold off a lot of names that had, you know, temporary cost pressures from the steel tariffs or higher transportation costs and built those positions up um, and, and feel very good about that. And that's really what I have as far as prepared remarks. Jason, happy to turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us today. I think you provided some great insights on what's been driving the markets recently and how you're navigating this environment. Thank you to all of our clients for listening in, and please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions on the markets or Von Nelson's strategy. Additionally, you can send us an email to bpawebinar at beaconpoint.com and we'll make sure to follow up with you that way as well. We hope to see you at our next Manager Insights webinar. Have a great day.